One of the things I wanted to just briefly point out, we don't get to see the whole thing today, but this is a little bit of what I was alluding to yesterday and, and last night a bit. This is a cartoon that shows our standard uh, schematic section of an idealized Carlton Rhyolite flow. This comes from work in the Slick Hills. Amy's flows don't follow it. They follow parts of it. But this is really based on 28 different flows we've been able to map out here. They don't always show the complete sequence, but they always show parts of it. Some of, it, some of them show all of it. Where parts are missing, the others still appear in the same vertical sequence. And so we start out at the base, very commonly, not always, with a sediment inner bed. Sometimes we find one rhyolite flow right on top of another. You can even put your finger on the contact occasionally, no soil or anything, paleosol. And then you see a sediment inner bed, victric tuff, mudstone, and uh, the rhyolite will come on top. Lots of times you'll see a pepperite base, and we'll see some of that tomorrow, not today. And then you go to the really chilled, originally obsidian glassy margin. You go up to a lithophysal zone, which I was talking about lithophysy yesterday. They're not as big as they're showing here. But the scale here, this is up to 400 meters. That's our maximum thickness of flow on Valley Mountain. And you get this lithophysal zone. These are gas voids rimmed by spherulites. So this is an area where you have just the right cooling rate. These volatiles are coming out of solution, but they don't have time to just escape. They're trapped and they form these often very large vesicles rimmed by spherulites, very distinctive. When we find them, we know we're just above the base or just below the top. They don't go all the way to the base, but they really tell you where you are. And then we go up in that same zone, we start to get a lot of flow banding, flow lamination, then everything disappears. The center is just a massive homogeneous fell site, very consistent in its appearance, sometimes a couple hundred meters thick or more. And, uh, and it actually, in, under the microscope, you can see the ground mass minerals coarsening inwards. Those tritomite needles I was talking about last night, you can see them progressively coarsen inwards. Uh, very, it's a, obviously a, a very simple cooling unit. One simple sheet of rhyolite came out, sat there and cooled slowly. Of course, you get the vertical columns all the time. I didn't show them. You go back up, everything's mirrored at the top. Often you get flow brescia at the base or the top. I didn't show it here. But that gives you a context for this stop. Now this stop is in flow one, and we're kind of near the top of flow one. We're in the felsidic zone in flow one. This is about as felsidic as flow one gets. It's not a perfect homogeneous fell site. I think flow one might, might have been a pretty thin flow. It might have been not too thicker than its present exposed thickness of 50 meters because we only get a narrow fell site zone. But the reason this is a hill here and these rocks are hard is we're in that, we're approaching that felsitic zone. Whenever you're out in this country and you see a hill held up by rhyolite or even a ridge, it's the felsitic zone at the center. It's really resistant to erosion. These chilled glassy margins will form grass. In a very so commonly known outcome. So if we could well top and the bottom of Civetico, why are the sediments at the top of the section? Uh, sometimes there'll be a sediment at the top, or sometimes just another flow on top. So they're not seals? I can't see these being seals. I think there's too much glass. I think there's way too much glass. Why is there so much glass at the bottom of the top? Of this? Is it the sub aerial? Yeah, sub aerial. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, I mean, Rhyolite will chill the glass and in contact with air all the time. It's just so viscous. <coughs> it's just normal for a basalt that says, no big deal, I'm still so fluid, I'll just develop a bunch of crystals. But rhyolite can't do that, it just stiffens the glass. Some of those glassy zones are preserved in the subsurface and, and they can get up to 30 or 40 meters thick. Is there a fluid sequence on top of the rhyolite package? That is kind of the end of the rift phase before you get into the carbon. Not exposed on the surface, but Bob has some evidence for that in at least one well. Right, right and one, in one well, the, the further south well of our group, which would be closest to the rift axis, there are apparently redistributed sediments from the fan delta that were prograding out into the rift. And they're very different petrologically from the, uh, from the Reagan. And, and is there a discordance? Are things still being tilted below the Reagan? Well, in the, we can't we can't see you know angles and things like that in the subsurface, but but it's it's a significant thickness in this place.
Uh, just a few more words about the rocks. So this is uh, Flow 1. You'll see a lot of feldspar phenocris in it. Uh, you'll see the paint color and automatically assume they're case par. That doesn't work here. Uh, sometimes th there's often two feldspars, a plagioclase and, a, and an alkali feldspar. Uh, the plagioclase occasionally will be white, but most of the time it's pink, just like the case bar. These rocks are, are just loaded with tiny disseminated hematite dust, which gives them their reddish color. And uh, so both the plage and the case bar are often are pink, and you pick up a nice fresh surface, you'll see beautiful albite twinning on a pink case, uh, a pink feldspar. I just did it myself. So I don't give this particular uh, rock to my students on 